In his famous Yoga Sutras, the great Rishi Patanjali defines the fundamental practice of yoga as citta vritti nirodaha, the complete restraint of all vrittis, all activities of your mind. He also prescribes a system of eight angas or steps through which you can restrain those vrittis and reach the state of samadhi, the ultimate goal of yogic meditation. To make his ancient teachings more accessible, we'll discuss each of those eight angas from a modern psychological perspective and draw upon important insights from my personal practice. But first, it's important to identify the particular kinds of mental activities that you have to restrain. Most introductory psychology books divide those activities into three broad categories, thoughts, emotions, and sensations. When you're not meditating, your mind usually produces a continual flow of ever-changing thoughts. Thoughts that arise, evolve, and fade away rather quickly. Your mind also produces emotions. Those emotions generally change less rapidly than thoughts. Some emotions can linger for days. We call them moods. In addition to your thoughts and emotions, your mind also produces sensations. Everything you see, hear, taste, smell, and touch. Even though sensations come from the world around you, you experience them only when they arise in your mind. Let me explain. As you watch this video, your eyes and ears capture an image of me and the sound of my voice. Then, all that information is conveyed to your brain. Because of the extraordinary complexity and power of your brain, an image of me and the sound of my voice is generated in your mind. Now, in addition to thoughts, emotions, and sensations, there's a fourth kind of vritti a unique mental activity that's of great importance to spiritual practitioners. It's your ego. Not ego as pride or arrogance, but rather as the sense of I-ness, your feeling of being an individual person. Psychologists call it reflective awareness or self-consciousness. In Sanskrit, it's called ahankara, literally the I-maker or the I-thought. This I-thought is a vritti produced by your mind just like thoughts, emotions, and sensations. Your ego doesn't come and go quite like your thoughts, emotions, and sensations do, so its presence in your mind is more subtle and difficult to distinguish. But you can easily recognize it like this. Suppose you listen to your favorite music and get so deeply absorbed in the powerful experience that you feel yourself getting lost in the music. When you get lost in the music, who is it that actually gets lost? Not you, because you can still hear the music and enjoy it. So, what gets lost in the music is actually your ego, the ahankara, your sense of individuality. That particular vritti vanishes from your mind whenever you get completely absorbed in a powerful experience. So, just like your mind produces thoughts, emotions, and sensations, it produces your ego as well. To understand this better, you can watch my video called An Intimate Encounter with Your Ego. You'll find a link below. A 
According to Patanjali, to attain samadhi, you have to restrain all four kinds of vrittis produced by your mind, thoughts, emotions, sensations, and ego. To enable you to do this, he prescribes a powerful sequence of practices in his eight angas, or limbs, of yoga. These eight angas are a series of steps, like rungs on a ladder or limbs on a tree. Those steps lead from introductory practices all the way to the ultimate goal of samadhi. The eight angas, as you may already know, are yama, prohibitions, niyama, injunctions, asana, postures, pranayama, breath control, pratyahara, sense withdrawal, dharana, concentration, dhyana, meditation, and samadhi, absorption. We'll discuss how each of these are to be practiced. First, yama and niyama. Before beginning an intricate and demanding practice like yogic meditation, you have to be ready, completely prepared. For instance, in my 20s, I approached a famous music teacher for lessons on playing the classical guitar. He told me to go home and practice a series of complicated scales for six months before coming back for any lessons. Only after practicing those scales could I fully benefit from his lessons. And in a similar way, only after the practice of yama and niyama will your meditations be fully effective. Yama is a set of five prohibitions prescribed by Patanjali. Ahimsa prohibits harming living beings. Satya prohibits lying. Asteya prohibits stealing. Brahmacharya prohibits immoral sexual activities. And Aparigraha prohibits possessiveness. Practicing these five yamas is meant to help you establish a dharmic lifestyle that's conducive to meditation. As a young man, I had to change my lifestyle when I found that eating meat and drinking alcohol badly affected my daily meditations. Not surprisingly, eating animals and drinking harmful liquids is prohibited by the very first yama. Ahimsa. Here's another reason for adopting a conducive lifestyle. Suppose you sit down to meditate just after having a huge argument with someone. When you try to meditate, that argument will almost certainly push its way into your mind again and again, ruining your practice. Any kind of strife or conflict in life can cause distractions to arise during meditation. For this reason, a life that's relatively free from conflict is necessary. It's easy to see why ancient practitioners often isolated themselves in mountain caves and remote huts. Since you probably can't do that, Practicing the five yamas will help you avoid much of the typical strife of day-to-day -day life. In addition to the five yamas, Patanjali also prescribes five niyamas, five injunctions. To become fully prepared for yogic meditation, your mind should not only be free from conflict, but also it should be calm, disciplined, and emotionally mature. Practicing the five niyamas is meant to help you cultivate these important qualities. The first niyama is shaucha, purity, having a pure mind, a mind that's free from anger, hurt, envy, resentment, and so on. Emotions like these are huge obstacles because they can hijack your mind, so to speak, when you try to meditate. 
To simply assume that your spiritual practice will automatically free you from all emotional impurities is a common but serious mistake. This mistake is often called spiritual bypassing because it leads you to bypass or avoid resolving problems in your life, problems that give rise to emotions like anger, hurt, and resentment. Years ago, I was sometimes guilty of this mistake, spiritual bypassing. One day, when I was living in my guru's ashram, I had a big argument with a fellow student. Afterwards, I felt hurt, angry, ashamed of my behavior, and deeply disappointed in myself. I was desperate to escape all those painful emotions, so I sat down in my room to meditate. I had learned how to use certain techniques to push away all kinds of painful emotions. But because I was so upset at that time, I really struggled to push them away. Finally, after two and a half hours of intense practice, the violent storm raging in my mind and heart finally settled down. I felt good even a bit smug about being able to free myself from all those painful feelings. Later in the day, I came across a student I had argued with, and in just a moment, all those emotions came flooding back. My efforts in two and a half hours of meditation went down the drain, so to speak. The purpose of this anecdote is to show that spiritual bypassing simply doesn't work. Emotional problems require emotional solutions, not spiritual solutions. Emotional problems have to be addressed and resolved in a mature, pragmatic manner. That's how emotional maturity is cultivated and Emotional maturity is essential for spiritual growth. Returning to the five niyamas, the second is santosha, patience or forbearance. This virtue can help you gracefully accept difficulties and discomforts that can't be avoided without getting irritated and distracted from your practice. Next, is tapas, religious disciplines like fasting, waking up early to meditate, and living simply without unnecessary luxuries. Such disciplines help you remain firmly focused on your spiritual practice. The next niyama is swadhyaya, regular spiritual study. Today, Many resources are freely available online, which can be a great help as long as you're highly selective about what you choose. The final niyama is Ishwara Pranidhana, devotion to Ishwara, God. Any kind of prayer or worship connects you emotionally to a reality that's infinitely greater than yourself. That connection can help you feel more secure and remain calm even in the midst of difficult situations. These yamas and niyamas are meant to be practiced not just before you begin meditating, but throughout your life. For example, after returning to that famous music teacher, after practicing scales for six months, in my very first lesson, he told me to continue practicing those scales every single day. Yama and Niyama are also to be practiced every day. Here, you can see that the conventional comparison of the eight angas to rungs on a ladder or branches on a tree is not completely correct. 
When you climbed the next rung or branch, you leave the lower one behind. But Patanjali intended that you gradually include one anga after another to develop and expand your ongoing practice. The third of Patanjali's eight angas is asana, posture. He defines it in a single sutra, sthira sukham asanam. Your posture for seated meditation should be sthira, firm or stable, and sukha, comfortable, pain-free. That means you can sit on the floor or in a chair, with or without a cushion and back support, as long as your back is erect, your head, neck, and shoulders are properly aligned, and you're comfortable. Most people find it uncomfortable to sit in Padmasana, the lotus pose, with each foot resting on the opposite thigh. So then, why is Padmasana practiced at all? And how did the elaborate system of asanas practiced in yoga studios today come about, since Patanjali never mentioned them? Well, advanced meditators need to remain seated comfortably for hours at a time, without being distracted by pain or needing to shift their limbs. The various standing, seated, and inverted asanas practice today were devised to help make your body sufficiently limber and flexible so that you too can sit in meditation for hours without feeling stiff or uncomfortable. An important aspect of asana that's often neglected is not how you sit, but where you sit. Patanjali doesn't discuss this at all. But many other texts do, including the Bhagavad Gita. Most of those texts recommend sitting in a remote place where you're not likely to be distracted by the activities of people nearby. When the weather allows, I love to meditate outdoors in a beautiful and secluded natural setting. But I usually meditate in my room which is not entirely free from distracting noises. Sometimes I use these noise-canceling headphones. The expensive ones work surprisingly well. An inexpensive alternative is to simply use foam earplugs. The fourth of Patanjali's eight angas is pranayama breath control. In India long ago, very little was known about human physiology and anatomy because the dissection of cadavers was not performed. Instead, the ancient rishis used their powers of observation and intuition to learn about the human body. They created a model of the body's nervous system describing it as having three main nerves, or nadis, running along the length of the spine and connecting to a vast network of 72,000 other nerves that radiate outwards throughout the body. Today, we know that their model is not anatomically correct. Yet, it helped them understand something very important about what we now call the sympathetic nervous system. Whenever you're frightened or threatened by something, your body's sympathetic nervous system triggers the so-called fight-or-flight response, which floods your bloodstream with adrenaline, cortisol, and other hormones that stimulate your body and mind to prepare you for action. 
The rishis discovered that by breathing very slowly and deeply, the sympathetic nervous system is calmed, and the fight or flight response is reduced, which results in physical and mental relaxation. They devised certain pranayama techniques that are extremely effective for calming your mind and preparing you for meditation. Information about those techniques is widely available. In my own practice, I often use a modified ujjayi pranayama technique that's described in my online course in meditation. You'll find a link below. Now, look at this chart. It shows how the practice of yama, niyama, asana, and pranayama prepare you for samadhi by gradually restraining your vrittis, the activities of your mind. Emotions are restrained through the practice of yama niyama, which helps free you from conflicts and gain emotional maturity. Sensations are restrained through asana, sitting comfortably in a quiet place. But restraining thoughts is much more difficult and can be achieved only with further steps of practice, beginning with pranayama. Notice the level of effort you have to exert at each stage. At first, to deal with the problems and challenges of day-to-day -day life, a lot of effort is needed. But by practicing yama and niyama, your dharmic lifestyle and increased emotional maturity will gradually make your life more free from conflicts, requiring less effort each day. Sitting in meditation doesn't require any effort at all, but you might need some effort to prepare your body for extended periods of meditation. Notice how pranayama and the following practices that lead to samadhi each require an increasing level of effort. To fully restrain your thoughts and diligently concentrate your attention, can be achieved only with significant effort. So, for Patanjali, meditation is certainly not mere relaxation. It demands effort, sustained effort. In the next part of this series, we'll discuss the practice of the remaining angas, pratyahara, sense withdrawal, dharana, concentration, and dhyana, meditation, the final practice that directly leads to attaining the state of samadhi. Mm -hmm.